Hello and welcome to Irish Football Fan TV. I'm delighted to be joined by one of Ireland's all-time greatest players, Liam Brady. Liam, good morning. How are you? I'm all right, Paul. Good morning to you too. Thanks very much. Well, listen, um, we've had a lot of uh, ex-players and current players on the show coming on and talking about their career and I'm fascinated by your career and everything you've done in the game. So I just thought I'd try my own hand to get you on and thankfully I have. So... Do you want to talk me through your earliest days um, as a footballer and kind of through your schoolboy career then? Yeah, well, I played, I'm from Whitehall, um, Northside Dublin. Uh, I played for St. Kevin's Boys, which was a matter of a few hundred yards uh, where they were based in Ellenfield Park from, uh, from my house. Uh, and pretty much all the kids around our area joined uh, who wanted to play football joined St. Kevin's. Uh, and I joined when I was about nine or 10, 11. Uh, and uh, in those days, I think they only played uh, under 13 was the beginning of, of uh, schoolboy football then. I know it's uh, uh, developed much more than that now, but in those days, uh, which would have been 1967, 68. Um, it was under 13 only uh, at the start of schoolboy leagues. Uh, and I played 13C for a couple of years uh, and then played 13A for Kevin's. And we had a very strong team, a really good team. And uh, we ended up winning a lot of uh, trophies uh, from, let's say, my age of 13 to 15. Um, Spotted by Arsenal playing for Kevin's, uh, invited for a trial at 13 years of age, went to London, uh, did well and was invited back and uh, left school after my intercert at 15 and went to London to play for Arsenal. You know, at St. Kevin's, uh, the guys from there actually got in touch with us to, you know, uh, say to let us know when this was actually out because they're so proud of what you've gone on to do in your career. Um, you must have great fond memories of the club there and obviously that gave you the chance then to go over and get your move to Arsenal. Yeah, uh, St. Kevin's was, a big, was and is still a big part of my life. Uh, uh, you know, they're a great club. They've gone from strength to strength. Uh, they're probably one of the strongest schoolboy clubs in Ireland. Um, They've had many players uh, uh, develop there and go on to play for Ireland. Um, Jeff Hendrick, uh, Robbie Brady, I think Damien Duff had a, had a spell with them as well. Um, so a really strong, well-run club. Um, uh, I know the people who, uh, who organize it and they're first-class people. Um, they've got a great pitch up in uh, up in Santry now, uh, not far from where I went to school, uh, St. Aidan's uh, CBS. Uh, they're pitched there. They've got an AstroTurf as well. They've really developed as a, as a, as a great schoolboy club. Yeah, and obviously uh, they, they produce so many players. And there's a good few of the upcoming under-21s were produced. Uh, Dara O'Shea and Dan Mandre was at Bowes now. But uh, a lot of them coming through all came through the St. Kevin system. But going on to Arsenal and uh, you signed for them, was it 1973, I believe you signed for them. And you had David O'Leary, Frank Stapleton and Johnny Murphy went over with you. Is that true? got your dates wrong there, Paul. I signed for them in 1971. I signed what was called as an apprentice. Sorry. Uh, in 73, I signed a professional contract. Oh, sorry. But I left uh, as a 15-year-old. Uh, I left in 1971. Arsenal just won the double, so they had a, a really top team. Um, and an, apprent an apprentice contract is, is exactly what it, 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 it states. It's... Uh, you have to work hard to to gain yourself a pro contract or to win yourself a pro contract and that's what every boy was aiming to do is the next rung on the ladder was to earn yourself a professional contract which i did in 1973 but frank came in 1972 and david came in 1973 i'm two years older than david and a year older than frank Okay, well, you know, you, you spoke about that there just uh, before I move on to Frank and, and David, but for a 15-year-old going to a, 
I know London and now it's it's easily accessible and everything with Wi Fi and everything like that. But back then, you're 15 going over. What was that like for like your family and you mentally going over to it? You're basically going into a men's environment at the age of 15. Well, I was from a football family. Uh, two of my brothers played pro con, uh, pro pro uh, football in England. Uh, they're much older than me. They're 20, 19 years older than me. Um, but they played for Millwall and Queen's Park Rangers. And when their career finished, they stayed in England. And they made their living there. So um, I was lucky going to London that I had two brothers nearby. I actually had another brother as well living in London, working in London. Uh, so it wasn't so daunting for me leaving home. It's still... It was still a big deal, uh, but I had family there. Uh, whereas Frank and David O'Leary, Johnny Morphy, who came with David, um, I'd say they found it harder than I did. Yeah. Well, talk me through. You obviously were, were very successful and you're, you're an Arsenal legend now. Would you want to talk me through your time at Arsenal? Well, I had uh, uh, so 71 and I left in 80, so I had nine years there. Uh, two years as an apprentice, then seven years as a pro. Uh, I got into the first team in uh, in 1973 from our debut uh, against Birmingham City. Uh, I was 17 years of age. Uh, I did well. Uh, played the next game against Spurs. Uh, we got beat 2 0 at White Hart Lane in, in the big London, North London derby. I hardly got a kick that game. So. Uh, I didn't keep my place, and then uh, over the course of the remainder of that season, I played about four or five games. The following season, which would have been 1970, uh, 73, 74, um, I got more games, and then progressed into being a regular in the in the first team, and I was playing with. Uh, a lot of the lads who won the uh, 1971 uh, double, uh, Charlie George, George Armstrong, John Radford, uh, Peter Simpson, uh, Pat Rice, who I went on to play a long, many years with Pat, Sammy Nelson, uh, another uh, Irish lad from Belfast. Um, and then, you know, Frank uh, was in the team as a 19 year old. David was in the team as a 17 year old. So. We had three, three from the South and in 1977, Terry Neal signed Pat Jennings. So uh, we had three from the South, three from the North. Then John Devine came from Dublin as well, followed David a year or so later. John got in the first team. So it was seven Irish guys playing for Arsenal at that time. So it, it was, a, it was, it was something, something else when, when you compare what goes on today, you know, to have seven lads playing for Arsenal. Um, and we had, towards the end of the late 70s, we had relative success. We got to uh, the FA Cup final, 78, 79, 80, uh, three FA Cup finals when the FA Cup was a big deal then, much, big, much bigger deal than it is now. Um, and uh, we won in 79, unfortunately we lost the other two. And we also got to a European Cup Winners Cup in 80 as well, which we lost on penalties. Uh, and that is something that I can't get out of my mind because I missed a penalty in the, in the, in the shootout. Uh, and we lost by 5-4, uh, I think, to Valencia. Um, but great times at Arsenal, um, particularly those uh, later years of the 70s, 78, 79, 80, uh, when we did so well. Uh, we were never going to win a league because we just simply didn't have the squad of players um, and Liverpool were pretty dominant then. They had a great side with Keegan and Toshak and then uh, later on with uh, Kenny Daglish and David Johnson up front, Graham Souness in the middle of the field. You know, they were, they had the squad, they had the team to, to dominate and, and they pretty much did in those years. Forrest came along under Brian Clough then. But it was a time in English football where uh, it was a uh, real competition for, for, for the league. Uh, but as I say, Liverpool were the team. Uh, the FA Cup was a big deal. And to win in 79 against Manchester United at Wembley, you know, it was a dream come true for me. What was, what was the, um, 
the because I know you mentioned that you lost two of the cup finals, but the one that you did win, and I was speaking, I don't know if you know Gary Spain, but he's involved with our show. He's a big, huge Ireland fan, and he was talking to me saying that that seventy nine FA Cup win was like one of the best cup finals ever. Yeah, funny enough, it was on here on 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 uh, ITV, which is uh, uh, you know uh, mainline TV. It was on here last week, and I got a number of people calling me or texting me to say they were watching it. Uh, uh, it was a dramatic cup final, in as much as that you know we were winning two nil with five minutes to go, and then Manchester United got two goals. Uh, in the 85th and 87th minute, and then we scored in the 89th minute to make it 3-2. The game itself wouldn't, uh, you know, I'd have to say, uh, it wouldn't go down as a classic for me, but the finish was so dramatic uh, that uh, I think it lives in everybody's memory, Paul. Yeah, I think that I, th- I think it's sweeter, obviously, getting the, la- the late winner, obviously. Um, but you 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 went on there to speak about you know missing a penalty and obviously there was the heartbreak then of missing or the, losing the other two uh, FA Cup finals. But you obviously went on to do more things and scoring penalties, which we will get to, um, and obviously uh, your time at Arsenal then later on. But kind of they moved to Juventus, um, and you spoke there about seven players playing for Arsenal, and you know what we would give now to have that many players playing at a top level team in the Premier League at the moment then you moved to Juventus how did that come about and for an Irish player to go to Juventus is so unheard of and it fascinates me now especially um, because you'd never really other than maybe Robbie Keane you wouldn't really hear of these kind of foreign moves and you were like a marquee player for, for Juventus at the time obviously well what happened in the late 70s um Kevin Keegan uh, went to Germany. He left Liverpool and went to Germany and he went to Hamburg and was hugely successful there. And I think Tony Woodcock did the same. He left, um, he left Knott's Forest and went to Cologne. And uh, it seemed um, that I was going to go to Germany as well. Uh, I wanted to further my career, I suppose. That's the best way of putting it. And, uh, and try my luck abroad. Um, I'd seen Keegan become very successful. He got Hamburg to two European Cup finals. I think he became European Player of the Year. He, there was a lot of focus on him and he seemed to be really enjoying um, going playing in another country. And I really made it my uh, ambition to do that. And I let my contract at Arsenal run out uh, in 1980. I didn't sign. They asked me to sign another contract, but I I didn't want to. And um, at that time, uh, the Italian league was closed to foreigners. In 1966, in the World Cup here in London or here in uh, England, um, Italy performed really badly and uh, they blamed the amount of foreign players in their league in, in Syria and they stopped all foreign players in 1966 being signed from uh, outside of Italy and they didn't open it up again until 1980 and it was then one foreign player per team in Syria um, and I just got lucky I suppose I think Juventus uh, had a list of players that they were trying to trying to uh, attract to the club. I was probably third or fourth on the list. Uh, and um, when they couldn't uh, get the signings they want uh, they wanted, I ended up getting to move to Juventus. And it was interesting because that year we talked about the uh, Cup Winners' Cup and missing the penalty in the semi-final of that competition that year. Uh, we played Juventus and uh, we played them in London. We drew 1-1 in the first leg and then went to Turin and actually beat them in Turin, which was an incredible result. Uh, and I think uh, one of the few times they've ever been beaten up till then in their own backyard. And we beat them 1-0 and we got to the final. And I played OK in the two games and I think they had me on the list, on their short list. And I ended up going to Juventus in 1980, July 1980, which is 
nearly 40 years ago now. And uh, wow. uh, at that time, they just had one player, one foreign player uh, for every club in Syria. So it's a bit kind of similar to like the way the MLS have kind of, I know they probably have, I think, three to a team, but it, it's kind of similar in that way. Um, in, in the MLS in America, they do that. They have foreign players in certain teams and you can only have a certain number. So I kind of get what you mean in, in that aspect. But there's a brilliant photo. I think you're just after getting off a plane, but it looks like you're off a plane and you're beside uh, Giovanni Trapattoni. Um, was that when you just signed or was that going to a game? I can't, it was just a famous picture I seen. It's in black and white. No, that was when I got off the plane. I'd already signed in London. I got off the plane and there was... Uh, we were on the tarmac in uh, in uh, in Turin. I flown I flown from Heathrow to Turin, uh, and when I looked out the window, there was at least hundreds of Juventus fans. And uh, uh, when I got, when I looked around the plane. All these people were wondering what was going on. Uh, so I got off the I got off the plane. Uh, didn't have to go through passport control. <laughs> Juventus had the uh, had the influence to put me in a car, and uh, I did a quick press conference somewhere in Turin Airport, and uh, uh, and I was driven in a car for about 20, 20 minutes, half an hour to the hills outside Turin where Juventus were in training camp, and um, Trapattoni did the driving, and uh, that was my first day in at Juventus, straight to training camp. It's funny how things obviously work out and then you obviously go on to work with him later on with the, with the Ireland setup and stuff. But talk me through your time at Juventus, you know, a, a massive club. And, you know, to to me, it still fascinates me, like an Irish player going to such a club of, of that stature. And you've done so well, like, as well. Like, it was, it's, for me, it's just amazing. And I think a lot of people um, my age and, and under you know, really associate you with just RTE and, and don't know the full background to who you played for and stuff like that. Obviously, I do, but the reason kind of I wanted to get you on was to talk through all of this type of stuff because it, for me, especially, it's so fascinating. So can you tell me about your time at Juventus, please? Well, I had two years there. Um, I was playing with some great players. Uh, Dino Zoff, uh, legendary Italian goalkeeper, was our goalkeeper. Uh, I think they had six or seven players in that team that went on to win the 1982 World Cup in Spain. Um, uh, great players I was playing with. Uh, and in midfield, I was playing with Marco Tardelli, who was one of the best midfield players I ever played with. It was different to me. Um, Trapattoni wanted me uh, <clears throat> to be the... Um, the playmaker in midfield, Tardelli was the engine, and we had another player called uh, Farino, who was the captain of the side, who was like the holding midfield player. Um, and we had uh, Roberto Bettiga up front, another legend of Italian football, centre forward, uh, and two young, fast wingers um, on right and left, Fana Marocchino, and a very strong defence that was pretty much the Italian defence. Zoff, Gentile, Cabrini, Shirea, and Kukuredu uh, all went to uh, the World Cup, as I said, in 1982 and won it. Um, and I had two great years there. First year, I, I uh, took me a few months to settle in. And, uh, you know, there was a few doubts whether uh, about me, whether Juventus had signed the right player or not. But uh, I got going in about my third month started to score goals as well from midfield uh i finished up the uh the team's leading goals goal scorer that year uh, i was playing much more forward Trapattoni, um you know was encouraging me to to get up around the box and uh so i uh had a really good first season at juventus we won the league uh we pipped roma for the league by uh, one point, um, and uh, well, I couldn't have started better. That uh, you know, a lot of people when I went, when I left England, they were critical of me going, uh, saying that uh, I'd only gone for the money and uh, that I wouldn't do well over there. So uh, to win the league and and play so well and uh, to settle in as quickly as I did was. 
it was a, a great success and I was really proud of what I did. Uh, before se- before second- you just go on to the second season, Liam, um, ha- you know where you say you struggled to settle it? Like, how was it for yourself with the language? You know, uh, I wouldn't imagine you spoke Italian before you went over. Um, and were you? Did you go by yourself, or did you have family with you going over at that time? Like, were, were you on your own, or did they travel with you? I just got married uh, at the end of May that year, um, and uh, my wife came and joined me. Well, once we were out of training camp, you go to training camp there, they lock you up for three weeks, and you don't see anybody. You concentrate on your training, and you get yourself fit, and then you have a few friendly matches, and then you come back to Turin. Uh, and then my wife joined me there, and uh, you know we had uh, we had uh, probably month six weeks in a hotel whilst we were trying to find a place to live, um, which we did eventually, and it was really nice. And Tardelli was a great help to me then, um, he, you know, as a friend, not only as a teammate, as a friend, and we're still big mates uh, to this day. Um, so uh settling in uh, the language was a problem uh better guy i roomed or roomed with him he was my roommate and uh he could speak some english and i was kind of helping him with his english and he was helping me with an uh, with my italian uh, and then i got myself a teacher uh and uh, who really helped me and i suppose after about six months i began to understand a everything pretty much everything that was being said to me and after about a year there i began to speak myself you know properly speak the language yeah which obviously helped you there but coming into the second season and uh i do want to touch about that penalty at the end of the season as well but talk me through your your second season from your perspective from the i suppose start to finish well you know we were favorites to win the league again uh and uh, we started well then we had a bit of a dip and my form wasn't as good as it had been the previous uh, previous season um but i picked it up in the second half of the season and we were vying with fiorentina then uh florence uh, the, uh, the city of florence fiorentina um, who had some really good players as well. They had Antonioni, who was the number 10 for Italy, and they had Bert- Daniel Bertoni, an Argentinian, and uh, he, was the, he was their foreign player. Um, and again, a bit like Roma the previous year, it was neck and neck all the way. Uh, uh, I'd heard a few rumours that, uh, you know, Juventus were going to uh, uh, be signing... Um, uh, Boniek from Poland. They were going to open up to and make it two foreign players for a team. Yeah. Um, and uh, it looked like, I thought anyway, that I was going to be playing with Boniek. Uh, I had a three year contract, so I had another year to go. Um, and towards the end of that season, it came about that uh, I'd heard that. Uh, uh, Juventus were going to sign Platini as well as Bonnie. Now, funny enough, I was going through some old stuff because of this lockdown in, uh, uh, you know, stuff I've kept over the years. And I, I kept diaries from, from you know, pretty much every year I keep a diary. Don't write much in it. Some things I did. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in that year, in 1982, uh, Italy played France in Paris. Uh, in February 1982, and uh, France beat them 2 0. And in my diary was France to Italy 0. And I had Platini magnificent. Uh, and he was magnificent that, that very night. And I think Juventus made a mind up or to go for him after that performance. And because they had Bonnet coming as well, uh, I was told. Uh, pretty much the last month of the season that um, I was going to be moved on and uh, and Boniek and Platini were going to come in as the two foreign players at Juventus. Uh, so I, it was hard to take. I, I didn't hadn't done much wrong at Juventus and won the title the year before. We were in, the, in, in a great position to win another one. Um, my former picked up the second half of the season, but I, I went on to learn that these things happen with uh, these uh, very wealthy uh, 
club owners. Uh, if they fancy something, they go and do it. They go and get it. And that's what happened with Platini. So we had three games to go, three or four games to go. And I think we beat Inter Milan in the fourth last game. I scored a goal from a penalty. Um, then we uh, went away to Udinese. And at that time, it's an interesting thing maybe for your listeners or your viewers, Paul. Paolo Rossi was in our squad, but he'd been banned for the best part of two years for match fixing. And uh, he had been with us all season and trained, but he was only eligible to play in the last three games. And uh, he, we were playing away to Udine, Udinese. And... Uh, this was his first game back, and uh, uh, we beat them 5-1. We went to goal down, so it was a bit scary uh, because we were in neck-and-neck neck run-in with Fiorentina. Uh, but we went on to beat them 5-1, and Rossi got the third goal or something like that. And that was his first, first game back in Italian football. And a few months later, he went on to be the top goal scorer in the World Cup in, uh, in Spain, uh, winning Italy the World Cup and scoring a hat-trick against Brazil. So he was some player uh, as well that I hadn't mentioned with all the others. Um, and we beat Udinese. Then we had a, a hard nil-nil at home to Napoli, which put Fiorentina exactly level with us going into the last game. Uh, and we went away to Catanzaro, which is it's a bit like going to Middlesbrough or somewhere like that. It's, uh, it's, it's a hard place to go and get a result, especially when there's a league title on it. But, uh, well, we, we, got, we got the result. We got a penalty 15 minutes from the end. I took the penalty and thankfully scored it. And I left Juventus uh, having won two titles. Um, Fiorentina on that particular day couldn't beat Cagliari. They drew 1-1 away. So we were champions again. I just want to take you back to the penalty. Now, you said there, I think people knew that Platini was coming in and you knew it was going to be your last game. Um, what what made you take the penalty? Because if you miss that, you know, it's obviously a disaster scoring it. But what, what was it like? Because obviously there's so much pressure. And Syria back then, um, you know, was, wasn't, wasn't an easy place to go and play football as well. Well, uh, I suppose... Uh... I, I've always, I've never minded responsibility, you know, uh, and when we got the penalty, uh, actually, when the news broke about Platini, you know, I really didn't want to play anymore for Juventus. Uh, I was so uh, disappointed and upset. And yeah. it was only when I talked to uh, people who, in and around me, really good friends, they said, look, don't, you got to do things the right way. You've got to be really professional. And uh, so I decided we, you know, I, I would give it my all till the end of the season. And uh, but one of the things I did say to Trapattoni is I don't want to take penalties anymore because I knew, that, you know, the pressure. Um, me leaving, I, I didn't feel that I needed that added pressure. Uh, and um, I, I, I spoke to Trapattoni and told him, and he said okay. And, we made one of the other players, can't remember who it was. Uh, I think it was a player called Virdis who went on to play for um, AC Milan, really top goal scorer. Uh, he was in our team at the time. He was, Trapattoni told him to take the penalties or he volunteered to take the penalties. Well, in the last match against Catanzaro, uh, Trapattoni had substituted him at about half an hour to go. So he wasn't on the field. And uh, when we got the penalty, uh, everybody kind of looked to me and said, well, come on, you're, you are really our penalty taker. You take it. So I did. And, uh, you know, a lot of people in Juventus or uh, Juventus fans say, you know, it was great that I took the responsibility to take the penalty. But I, you know, it, it just came, uh, how can I say, normal to me. Uh, uh, I didn't. Uh, I would rather take the penalty myself than let somebody else take it who wasn't too sure about taking it. You understand, Paul? Yeah, yeah, I get what you mean. Well, kind of, it, it was some way to leave, and obviously, you're 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 so 
you know well renowned there at the club like I, I believe you've gone back and you get such a great reception which is fantastic to hear really yeah you know two two i was the first foreigner uh, at the club when they opened up the the frontiers again and uh, um, in the two seasons i won two league titles and i finished up you know scoring the winning goal in the last match so uh, yeah um, you know I've got great memories of that place, and I think the, the, the you know the, the fans of Juventus have appreciated uh, what I did for the club in those two years. Yeah, well, I just want to go into um, your time at Serie A then, because you went on to play for Inter, Ascoli, Sampdoria as well. So do you want to talk me through your time there, and then we'll we'll go on to your Ireland career then after that. Well, <clears throat> Juventus. Uh, when they told me that uh, Platini was coming, they then wanted to know where I wanted, where I wanted to go. And I, I was thinking about should I come back to Arsenal? Um, you know, again, I've got in my diary. Ron Atkinson was manager of Manchester United. He was ringing me up to go back to Man United. Um, but uh, myself and my wife had settled so well in in, in Italy, and we really liked the lifestyle. And uh, we we decided to stay and or if we got a good italian club you know um and rome came uh wanting me uh, and juventus wouldn't wouldn't allow me to go to rome because they figured that they were going to be a big rival and they figured right because the next year roma won the title uh but uh they they looked after me financially because I had another year to go on my contract. So uh, they they blocked the moon to Rome, but looked after me financially. And I met the president of uh, of uh, Sampdoria, and I really liked him. And he told me he had, he had great plans for the club, great ambitions for the club. Now Sampdoria would be a bit like an Ipswich or uh, a Norwich someone like that in, in, yeah. in those days and uh, uh, but he had big plans for and he sold me the club uh, and I went to I, I went to visit where it was based and it was the most beautiful part of it in, in the city of Genoa on the Italian Riviera and it was absolutely beautiful place to live uh, so uh, Decided to go there within a week. Uh, the president was true to his word. He signed Trevor Francis uh, from Manchester City, a uh, great attacking player. He signed Roberto Mancini, who went on to be a fantastic player for uh, for uh, Sampdoria and for Italy. Uh, and we know he went on to be a tremendous manager. He's also a manager now of uh, the Italian national team. So Mantovani was the president's name and he was true to his word and we became really strong, we had no problem establishing, uh, uh, establishing ourselves in, in Serie A, they'd just been promoted. Um, we beat a lot of top teams, the first three games of my first season at Sampdoria. Um, we beat Juventus at home in the very first match, which was uh, sweet for me. Uh, we beat Inter Milan away and then we beat Roma at home. After three games, we were maximum points on top of the league, but it didn't last because we just didn't have the players to compete with the very best team. But I had two great years at Sampdoria. I played really, really well. And Inter Milan came and signed me. And I went off to, uh, to Milan. Uh, uh, thought we were, I was going to have a great chance of winning the title again. We finished third in our first year, fifth in our second year. Uh, it didn't really go for me there. Um, I had... We got to the semi-final of two UEFA Cups, beaten by Real Madrid twice um, in, uh, in two, you know, two great games, uh, both home and away. We, we had two goals start twice going to Madrid and ended up losing. Uh, it was a really difficult place to go to as it, as it is now. And uh, so uh, Inter was a, a disappointment. But I stayed on in Italy. I went to Ascoli for for another season. Um, uh, but I didn't like the club. I didn't like the president. And I was, that was 
only thing I regret about my time in Italy was moving to Aston. Okay, well, well, we won't dwell on it too much. Um, <laughs> you don't want to go there. Uh, we'll talk then about your 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 Ireland debut, um, against the USSR and winning three nil because Owen Ham was on with us the other night. Um, and he spoke about how you came into that game as if you've been playing international uh, football your whole career. I think you were only eighteen or nineteen. I think he said at the time. Yeah, I was eighteen. Uh, uh, October thirtieth, seventy four. Um. Johnny Giles was wasn't long the manager. He'd been the manager uh, maybe a, a year, uh, but uh, I think he made a great impression on everybody who worked with him. He was very very professional, uh, and I think he took Ireland from being a bit of a Mickey Mouse setup uh, into a team that uh, you know fancied that they could be the best teams in Europe. And that hadn't been the case, I think. Uh, just talking to John and Eamon Dunphy there uh, recently, and he was saying that the mentality of the Irish players at that time was, you know, let's keep the score down, and if we can get a draw or something like that, that'd be great. But Giles introduced a, a, a confidence to the team, um, and... I didn't know I was going to be playing in that match against the USSR when we arrived in Dublin, but I think it was two days before he said, look, you know, I'm going to play, you know, uh, you're going to be playing on, in midfield alongside me. He said, but keep it quiet. Uh, you know, uh, I don't, I just wanted to put you at rest uh, that you're going to be playing, you know. So uh, I was really excited going in, into that game. My brother played for Ireland in 19... Uh, early 60s, 63, 64, Ray, and, uh, you know, I, I, from that time I saw him playing for his country, I had uh, the ambition and the dream to do it myself, and here I was, I was gonna, it was going to happen for me, and uh, we absolutely played great on the day against the, the Soviet Union, beat them 3-0, uh, and my career with Ireland got off to a great start, and the next game we went to Turkey, drew 1-1, uh, then we, I think, beat Switzerland 2-1, so we were top of the group, having beat uh, the Soviet Union 3-0. We had a great chance of qualifying, uh, but on the road we, we lost two games to the Soviet Union, narrowly 2-1 in, in Kiev. That was at the time uh, that um, uh, the Soviet Union, Ukraine, Georgia, they were all, all, all the population of those countries were all playing for just the Soviet Union. And, They're all uh, combined, yeah. Yeah, so they had quite a few Kiev players in the team, so that's why we played in the city of Kiev. We lost 2-1, uh, and then we went to Bern to play uh, Switzerland, <clears throat> and we lost 1-0, ended up beating Turkey 4-0, where Don Given scored all four goals, and we missed out by uh, one single point uh, to go to the go to the Euros uh, and we all know that we had to wait an awful long time before we actually did qualify for something. But Giles took us very close uh, and as I say he gave the team a confidence and uh, a belief um, and I had, well, my first two or three years with Ireland, uh, we didn't lose very many games. Yeah, and, and that kind of brings me on then to the to the 82 campaign and you know how how close we got there you know um Owen was on the other night and he was talking about the the game in Brussels and uh, the referee Nazari I think his name is um he was going on saying how he'd been paid off and stuff like that that must have been so frustrating like what would it have meant to qualify at the time in 82 well because everybody every player's ambition is to play in the world cup finals you know and uh you know we were not different and we were in a very tough group with uh, Holland, um, uh, Belgium, and France. You know, trying to qualify from that group, uh, but there was two to qualify, and uh, we got off to a great start. I think we beat the Dutch in, in Dublin two one, and um, it was neck and neck coming uh, right till the end. Um, we beat France at home. Um, 3-2, um, which was a big result for us. 
it gave us a great chance. And I think then we went to to Belgium and we were absolutely robbed in uh, in Brussels, where uh, a draw would have been enough for us to get to the World Cup finals. And the referee, well, since we found out that uh, he was paid and uh, uh, we didn't qualify, and actually in France as well we had a terrible refereeing decision i think at the time uh, i think fifa either influenced uh, referees or uh, they were getting uh, payments from the nationals associations to make sure that um, certain teams went forward well that's basically not, what owen said the other uh, night sorry that's basically what Owen said the other night that, you yeah, know, uh, no doubt about it. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was, it was, wasn't until we qualified that, and I think uh, qualifying in 88, uh, put Ireland on the map, uh, put the supporters in the minds of, of UEFA and FIFA that we want these people at the tournaments. And I think under Jack, um, we got the rub of the green and fairness uh, that we hadn't had before. Yeah, well, as I said, I think Owen was saying that, you know, if if the ref had done well, that I think federations were saying, oh, you'd have something waiting. I think he said it was a Mercedes or something maybe waiting for you at the airport or something like that. And the fact that maybe he said, I think he said the FAI maybe didn't do it. But in fairness, we were doing things the, the right way by not given them anything but he was just saying that maybe other federations were charming them. but anyway um i don't 80s... know how many federations but i know on those that two particular evenings in paris and in uh, uh in um uh, in brussels uh i felt that you know the referee wasn't correct he wasn't he wasn't fair and actually you know if you go back to our, my time with johnny giles as well uh, particularly in bulgaria uh we had a bad decision that could have could have given us a chance to qualify for um the um 78 world cup in argentina so 78 and 82 we missed out i've no doubt on bad refereeing decisions and the next two campaigns 84 86 we weren't good enough uh there were, there were better teams than us in the groups and uh and we didn't uh we didn't get close you're saying about 86 and um the starting off the campaign but uh we drew 2-2 with, with uh, belgium and how was that you scored a penalty in like the last minute which was crucial how did that compare much to your juventus penalty when uh, obviously winning the league well uh, yeah i was uh, you know there's a lot of speculation that i wouldn't be in jack's teams uh, when when he got the job uh, i think my first game was against wales and we lost one nil um, in a bad match against wales uh, at the lansdowne road it was lansdowne at its worst where they just finished the rugby season it was a dry spring day the pitch was bone hard and and, and bumps everywhere um and Wales beat us 1-0 in a very scrappy match and I didn't know Jack was wanted to change the style of play he didn't want me to be getting the ball from from uh, the back four he wanted uh, the ball played directly from the back four or kicked out by the goalkeeper straight up front and then we'd all push up and try and win the ball in the opposition's half um, and it it looked at the outset that uh, I might be, it might be the end of my Irish career. I might go for somebody else, but he picked me in Brussels and I had a pretty good game and I got a very important goal in the last minute. Um, and I went on to play all the eight qualifying matches. I think it was eight uh, in that campaign um, and probably played as good as I ever played for Ireland uh, in those games. And uh, it culminated with us qualifying, albeit luckily or unexpectedly. Um, but, you know, we were a hard team to beat. We were a hard team to play against. We won a lot of matches. We beat Brazil and Dublin as well, um, which uh, I don't know whether we'll ever see an Irish team beat a Brazilian team again. But uh, we did that day in Dublin, and that's how good we were. And who scored the goal that day, Liam? I can't remember. 
<laughs> Paul McGrath, is it? Yeah, well, like, to, to, you, you know, when you look at your career and, you know, to score against Brazil, to beat Brazil, you won Serie A by scoring the winning, winning penalty. I know you won it twice, but you were the main reason why they won it that day. But, like, looking back at the, on these type of things, like, is it surreal for you as it is, like, surreal for me like, looking at it now? No, it's not. And don't take that as an insult. I, I mean it in a complimentary not, way. Not, not taking it as an insult. Yeah, it's, it's um, you know, and uh, football's been great to me, uh, Paul. It's been uh, my life for the last 50 years. As I, as I said to you, I, I went to Arsenal in 1970. Uh, I went in 69 for it. So you can you can say it's 50 years uh, the game. I've, I've been part of the game. I went on to manage uh, uh, Celtic and Brighton. Then I became head of youth development at Arsenal for the best part of 20 years. So I've had a great time in football. Um, and uh, it's great to have all those memories, great to have all the memories of, of success, uh, of, of all the players I've played with and all the friends I've made. Um, it's, yeah, uh, that's that's the most important thing for me, is the longevity of it all. It really has been uh, great for me, football. Yeah, just going to go on the last couple of things. <laughs> and you, you, your goal, or sorry, your performance uh, against Bulgaria, but it's, a lot of people say it was your best ever display for Ireland. Uh, I know maybe the ending of the game wasn't wasn't the best, but um, that ultimately led, uh, led us towards Euro 88 then. Um, so how was that for you and then uh, how did you feel missing out on Euro 88 because that was obviously our first uh, tournament I know you missed out through injury well when we beat Bulgaria 2-0 and I was sent off I didn't give it much thought because uh, you know Bulgaria only had to beat our draw with Scotland in Sofia in their backyard uh, and Scotland weren't getting very many good results at that particular time so I I didn't give as much chance of qualifying but we did and that was the break that Jack got that maybe Owen and Johnny Giles certainly didn't get. Um, and we had a great Euros. We beat England 1-0 and uh, we beat, uh, we drew with the Soviet Union again 1-1 and uh, just lost narrowly to Holland in a great campaign. And it really, I think, uh, got the people behind the uh, soccer team then. And, uh, but by then, I got banned, uh, as you know, for four games, reduced to two um, uh, when the FAI appealed the the, uh, the ban of four games. I got reduced to two and Jack said that uh, I'd be part of the squad and, uh, you know, we'd see how we, how we, how we would go. So uh, that was something for me to really look forward to as 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 everybody knows uh i hadn't played in a, a european championship i hadn't played in a world cup so this was going to be my big chance albeit that i'd only be eligible for one of the games uh the last one against holland but in february of that year uh i uh ruptured my crucial ligament and uh, that's a very serious injury uh at any time and in those particular days, it was uh, you know, almost a career ender. Uh, but uh, um, I fought my way back, but I had to miss out on the Euros. Uh, I went uh, with the team, which was great. And we had a great time and great results. Uh, and by the time the next campaign for the World Cup uh, came about, um, I wasn't the same player and Jack had moved on with different players, uh, Andy Townsend uh, in particular in midfield. He, he liked to have two strong, powerful lads in midfield. Uh, and as I say, after the Euros, he had the likes of Ronnie Whelan, Kevin Sheedy, um, Paul McGrath, uh, Andy Townsend, Ray Houghton on the right wing, you know. so. I was, it was going to be difficult for me to get back into that team. And uh, uh, in the end, uh, well, everybody knows that I didn't go to the World Cup in uh, 1990, which is uh, a shame. I think if I had been 
um, a different style of football. Uh, some managers might have taken me. Uh, I was back playing for West Ham. I wasn't the same player, uh, and that's why I retired in 1990. Yeah, because um, you know I was still no questions with uh, Gary Spain the other night, and as I said before, I'm not sure if you know who he is, but like he is like an encyclopedia of Irish football. But he was there, I think. There was a friendly, and if you don't want to go into this, you don't. You don't have to. I think it was a friendly against Germany, maybe at home, and you were brought off in the first half. And he just said that that seemed to be kind of the end of of your kind of reign. I know you had the um, testimonial after that, but did you feel at that point then kind of you knew your your time was kind of coming to an yeah, end? Yeah, well, you know, my getting back in the team was going to be very difficult for the reasons I've explained after my injury and the fact that Jack had moved on and the lads who had come into the team were really top-class players, so I was always going to struggle to get back in. Uh, and as you say, I was taken off after about 25 minutes, uh, 30 minutes in, uh, in against Germany. Uh, still don't understand to this day why he did it. I think uh, he could have waited till halftime and then said, right, I'm making a substitution. And then spoke to me afterwards and said, look, Liam, I'm moving on with different players. I think that would have been uh, the, the right thing to do. Um, but yeah, uh, I disagreed with him on the day. Uh, we had a pretty much a stand-up row at halftime when the team came back in, and I decided to retire. Uh, and that's how it ended. Yeah, well, you, you had your last cup anyway against um, Finland, your testimonial, and I, I believe your send-off was, was fantastic. Um, so, so what was that like for yourself to get a nice kind of uh, way of saying goodbye, I suppose? Yeah, well, the FAI were very good to me. They they allowed me to have a testimonial prior to the team going for uh, to Italy in 1990. Uh, you know, I pretty much made up with Jack. Uh, you know, a few weeks later, uh, when all the dust had settled, uh, he wrote me a nice letter, and I wrote him a nice letter back. I had a great time qualifying for the Euros under him. As I say, I played uh, probably as good as football as I ever played for Ireland, and. Uh, mentioned some of the games that we won uh, <coughs> big games uh, against top class opposition uh, so uh, we buried the hatchet and uh, uh, I went off to the World Cup in 1990 with the BBC and that was the start of my TV stuff and uh, I had a great time in Italy uh, probably a better time than some of the lads that went who, who didn't get to play the likes of Ronnie Wheel and Frank Stableton, who have been waiting a long time to play for Ireland in the World Cup. Uh, they didn't get the chance, but I was having a great time covering it for the BBC. Yeah, which obviously led on to, you know, you're, you're obviously doing media now, but you went on after that, after West Ham, when you finished up there, you went off to manage Celtic and Brighton, but I think you're kind of most um, associated, most people know you more so with your time at Arsenal, that very successful time, and you brought through a lot of uh, players. And there was a lot of Irish players who've kind of came over. Um, Keith Fahey actually got on to me yesterday uh, to, to actually ask. He said, um, if you're talking to Liam, will you ask him what I was like when I went over? Because um, you brought through a lot of, uh, not only youth players but you brought through a lot of uh, Irish players and a lot of players I've had on the show had said that they'd had trials and you were you were great to every of the Irish players that came over which is fantastic to hear yeah well um, one of my targets was to get the best Irish players over and uh, you know that doesn't necessarily guarantee that they're going to make it at Arsenal it was a pretty hard place at the time once Wenger came you know he brought some top class players in so it wasn't an easy place for any kid uh, to make any inroads into the first team uh, so uh, the Irish kids that came, I'm glad to say, uh, even if they didn't make it at Arsenal, they went on to have good careers. Keith was a, a smashing midfield player. Uh, he was a bit homesick, I would have said at the time. You know, it was difficult for him to come and settle down. And he had his uh, he had his uh, uh, m moments where he wanted to go home. I think he wanted to pack it in. Um, and eventually, I think he did go home. He went to Villa after Arsenal, uh, and he then he went home. I think, and then he he, yeah, got he, his, did, yeah. he got his he got his head right, he got his mind right, and went on to have a very good career, and went on to play for for the national team, which was great, you know. And there was a number of kids. Anthony Stokes uh, went on to play for Ireland, have a good career. 
uh, and even Stephen O'Donnell, I think, who's manager now at uh, St. Pat's, uh, sorry, he man. went have a, a, a very fine career in the League of Ireland. So there was a lot of lot of Irish kids that came uh, with Stephen Bradley as well. Was he in there? Yeah, Stephen was a very talented fifteen-year-old, but he, he didn't actually become strong enough to be able to cope with the uh, English football um, at that time. Um, I think he went back and uh, had a, had a good career at home, and he's now manager of Rovers, which is great to see. So all these all these lads have had um, a, a career out of uh, out of out of football, which is, is, is what we all wanted to do. You know, we just all wanted to play football and to get paid for it was a bonus. Yeah. Just lastly, um, obviously you were working with Giovanni Trapattoni and you'd played with him at Juventus uh, uh, and obviously Marco Tardelli. What was your time like with that being back with the national team and being involved with the setup? Well, it was great. Uh, I loved it. Absolutely loved it. The lads were brilliant, you know, uh, uh, Damien Duff, uh, Richard Dunn, Robbie Keane, uh, all all smashing lads, you know, the whole whole lot of them. And for me to be working again with the Irish team uh, and try and help, uh, you know, get results and qualify for a World Cup, which it was then, uh, was, was tremendous. I had to ask Arsenal permission because uh, I was going to... Uh, you know, be away quite a bit, traveling with the Irish team, watching matches here in England, watching our players playing. Um, but I, I really, I really loved it, and uh, very nearly got to a World Cup as uh, as a coach uh, as well. Uh, if it wasn't for uh, that terrible decision in uh, in Paris uh, with the Thierry Henry handball, uh, we went very close. Uh, uh, Trapattoni. Another referee decision. Yeah, yeah. But I actually think uh, it, it, that wasn't fixed. I think he just got it completely wrong. It was so obvious. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that he, he couldn't have seen it. Uh, uh, other, other. Well, it, 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 it damaged his reputation tremendously, didn't it? You know. Uh, so um, I don't think it was uh, it was a case of a fixed fixed match or a bent referee. Um, I think yeah, it was a genuine mistake, but uh, <clears throat> as we well, all know, we that night been. we played some fantastic football. That night, it's probably um, probably the best game under Trapattoni. Maybe well, I know a lot of people say because that France team was a fantastic team. You know, we were very very unlucky to to lose to them. Yeah, well, we uh, I thought over the two legs we deserved to win, and you know when uh, Robbie put us a goal up, we had two or three other chances before the end of the ninety minutes that uh, we were uh, real good chances to to, to make it two 0 and I think that would have been the end of the France. We we played them off the park that night. Um, it was only in injury time that I think when we had to make a couple of substitutions and, and so forth that. Uh, uh, they began to make some inroads into the game, but uh, uh, it shouldn't. It shouldn't have happened, should it? Uh, but uh, under Trapattoni, I think we didn't lose. We didn't lose one match in the in the qualifying group. Um, and Italy were in the group. We should have beaten them in in Crow Park. Uh, we let the stupid goal in the last few minutes. Trapattoni went berserk. Um, Glenn Whelan scored a great goal that day. He scored a great goal from a free kick, uh, and uh, I think it was Sean St. Ledger, was it? He scored yeah, a header. Yeah, header, yeah. Uh, you know, we had the Italians beat, uh, and uh, Trapattoni couldn't believe that uh, we were naive enough to concede the second uh, the, the second goal to Italy in the last few minutes, uh, which stopped us having a chance of qualifying automatically. I think it was only an outside chance. But then we went on to play France, and... And what we thought was going to be an open draw of the eight teams that had to go into a playoff, then FIFA changed the moved the goalposts again as they wanted France and the bigger teams to be at the World Cup, uh, which is FIFA all over. And um, uh, well, we had to we had to take on the French, and uh, we very nearly did it. But I had had two years doing that, and I really couldn't. To to be fair to Arsenal, I really couldn't carry on. Uh, so I had to go back and do my job full time at Arsenal, uh, and but I really enjoyed my time with uh, 
trap again because I had him when I went to Italy for two years, first off. And with Marco Tardelli, who was, who, as, I, as I told you, Paul was a very good friend of mine. And we had a great time together. And they went on to qualify for the Euros in, <coughs> in, uh, in 2012, which was brilliant for the country, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, in Poland. Um, probably results didn't go our way, but I thought the, the group was very tough, in fairness. You know, you're playing against Croatia, Italy, and, and Spain. Um, and we were kind of built on, on defence. Italy and Spain finished up in the final. <laughs> exactly. So I think that goes to show as well. But, you know, um, at at the moment, are you, are you still involved in Arsenal? No. Okay, so... I'm retired now remembering I just have uh, have my RTE stuff uh, which is uh, stopped as a moment for the reasons everybody knows uh, I'm looking forward to going back to that when it's up and running again um, whether they'll finish the Champions League this season uh, I think it's doubtful um, so we'll have to just wait and see uh, you know we're living in a, in, a, in a time where nobody really understands what's going to happen and uh, you just want everybody to be safe and well, and let's try and stop this disease. Yeah, I think I think you said that perfectly. Well, Liam, I, I know we've had you on for just over an hour there, and I just want to say it's been absolutely fantastic to have you on, and, and a massive pleasure and a massive honour for me to have someone of your prestige on the channel. So thank you so much for coming on. I hope you stay safe, and I hope to see you on RTE very soon. I hope you can get out on that golf course soon, because I know you have, love your golf. Um, so yeah, I just want to say a huge thanks for coming on. My pleasure. I hope uh, your viewers enjoy it. All the best.